communication can be tough. Uh, parents sent their uh, son to Boy Scout camp and he sent them a letter to let them know he was doing great and everything was, was going well, but far from uh, assuring his parents, it only increased their angst. Uh, this is from Cole, their son. Scoutmaster told us to write in case you saw the flood on TV and are worried. We're okay. Only one of our tents and two sleeping bags got washed away. Luckily, none of us drowned because we were all up in the mountains looking for Chad. Oh yes, he's fine. Call his parents. He can't write because of the heavy cast. I got to ride in one of the search and rescue jeeps. It was neat. We never would have found him if it weren't for the lightning. The scoutmaster, Walt, got really mad at Chad for going hiking by himself. He said he did tell him, but he probably didn't hear him because it was during the fire. Did you know that when you pour gas on a fire, the gas can blows up? The wet wood didn't burn, but one of the tents did. David will look really weird until his hair grows back. We'll all be home Saturday if Scoutmaster Walt gets the car fixed. It wasn't his fault about the wreck. Um, the brakes worked okay when he left. He says when a car is as old as his car, you expect things to break down. That's probably why he can't get insurance. <laughs> We think it's a neat car. He doesn't care if we get it dirty and if it's hot sometimes, he lets us ride on the fenders. We take turns, but it gets pretty hot with 10 people in the car. He let us take turns riding in the trailer until the highway patrolman stopped and talked to us. Scout Mr. Walt is a neat guy. He's teaching Terry, he's a good driver, and he's teaching Terry how to drive on the mountain roads where there's not much traffic. Did you know that you don't need guardrails on roads that don't have much traffic? <laughs> the only traffic we see up there are logging trucks. <laughs> this morning, all the guys were diving off the rocks into the river. He didn't let me because I can't swim. And Chad because he thought he'd sink because of the big cast. So he let us take a canoe across the lake. It was so great. You can still see some of the trees under the water from the flood. Scoutmaster Walt isn't crabby like some scoutmasters. He didn't even get mad about us losing the life jackets. <laughs> Guess what? We're all getting our first aid batches. When Dave dove in the river and cut his arm, we got to see how a tourniquet works. <laughs> Wade and I threw up, but Walt said it was probably just food poisoning from the old chicken. <laughs> he said he got used to getting food poisoning that way with the food they ate in prison. <laughs> We have to go now. We're going to town to mail our letters and buy bullets. <laughs> Don't worry about anything. We're all fine. Cool. If it is hard for us to communicate with each other, imagine how hard it is for God, who is high and holy, to communicate with us. We have some birds that like to build nests in the eaves of our house. And I want to go out there and tell them and say, hey, fly away, build someplace else. But I can't talk to birds. If it's hard for me to communicate with birds, imagine how hard it is for God to communicate with us. Does God speak to us? Maybe you don't believe in God and question if there is, even is a God to speak with us. Uh, maybe you make no claim to faith in Christ. Uh, you question if Jesus, whose birth we celebrate tonight, really is, was born of a virgin and really is the Son of God, and you're not certain He's ever spoken to you. Maybe you wonder how God speaks to us. I believe God speaks to us, and I'd like to try to convince you uh, some of the ways He speaks to us tonight. I want to make four observations about how God speaks to us. Matthew, one of the gospel writers, uh, tells us that when Jesus was born, God spoke to some wise men. We find the account in Matthew 2, 1 to 18. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. 
Uh, Magi were wise men who studied the stars. Uh, likely they came from southern Arabia. Uh, they were probably not Jews and followers of God, but what we would call today pluralists. They took some truth from uh, this culture and that culture and kind of weaved it together. Uh, they may have learned about the God of Israel from as far back as the Queen of Sheba, who studied under Solomon, the King of Israel. My point is that God speaks to all of us. You don't have to be a Christ follower. Uh, God loves all people he created. He wants to have a relationship with us. And so he reveals himself to us to try to uh, uh, draw us to him. Uh, he spoke to the wise men through a star that led them to Bethlehem. Uh, they discerned a star that indicated that a king had been born. Uh, they apparently had some scrolls uh, that foretold that a Messiah would be born in Israel. So when they saw the star, they just obeyed, and they followed it. God spoke to them through a star. He can speak to, to you through the beauty of a moon, uh, the grandeur of a sunset, uh, the awesomeness of a snow-capped mountain. Uh, he can speak uh, to you through an event in your life, through a person, uh, through a dream, uh, through the Bible, or a prompting in your spirit. Uh, he speaks to his creation all over the world. Uh, Nabil Qureshi uh, grew up as a devout uh, Muslim. And uh, his parents were strict Muslims and they taught him the Quran. Well, when he uh, went to college, he came to the United States and he was assigned a Christian roommate. So here we had Nabil, a strong Muslim with David, a strong Christian. And they began to talk about their respective faiths. And they began to argue with each other. And, the, the discuss, and they challenged each other. And so it forced Nabil to study uh, Islam and to study the Quran. And, and as, as the more he studied it, he found that, you know, the Quran claimed that there were no errors in it. And he found all kinds of errors. And uh, uh, it was all the talk about Muhammad and, and uh, what a, a, a great man he is. And he found all the things he had done that uh, really, so he found it, his faith didn't really support his belief. In contrast, then he began to study Jesus. And he found that he, he became convinced that Jesus really is the Son of God. And he committed his life to Christ. You know, if you Google Muslims who have become Christians, you'll find uh, over 20 books on the market today. Uh, I have read all kinds of accounts of Hindus, uh, Buddhists, Muslims, or atheists who uh, maybe an event happened in their life and uh, they pray. Maybe something like, you know, something happens and they pray, God, show me who you are. Uh, who, are, who, are you the true God? Uh, is Jesus really your son? And uh, they become convinced and they're led to Christ. Uh, my point is, God speaks to all of us. Uh, we just have to be open enough to the truth so that we don't miss it when he does speak to us. Two, God speaks through small things. Verse three, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him heard that there was a, a newborn king. Uh, the wise men come and, and Herod says, no, there's no, there's no newborn king here. Uh, the wise men are surprised. They expected to find the newborn king born in the palace in Jerusalem. When he had called together, Herod, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod calls together the scholars and he says, where's the Messiah supposed to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem. So he learns that it's in Bethlehem, but there's no indication that Herod or anybody else in Jerusalem moves a muscle to see this newborn king. Herod thinks, oh, it's just a baby born in silly little Bethlehem. I don't have to worry about that. I can snuff out a baby. The birth of Jesus was so small, Herod thought, I don't need to worry about it. 
So Herod and all Jerusalem receives a message from God for, through the wise men that there's a newborn king born somewhere, probably in Bethlehem, but they don't believe it and they don't obey. They don't go to see. God surprises us that his coming is so small. Uh, his son isn't born in a palace. He doesn't come with an, an army with chariots and horses. He's not born in a major city. He's born in a little remote town of Bethlehem in a smelly stable. The wise men come and they're surprised that no one's worshiping the newborn king except some shepherds. It's so small. There's no fanfare. Charlie was 10. School had let out for Christmas break and his parents had decided to spend the holiday in their, in their vacation home in the country. He sat in the bay window and he was happy to trade the black streets of London for the cotton-like white snow on the hills outside of London. His mom said, uh, would you like to go for a ride? And he jumped at the chance. And uh, she drove down the twisted road. The tires crunched over the snow. Uh, he pressed his nose against the window. He was delighted. His mother was anxious. The snow began to fall heavily and visibility decreased. Uh, she came around a, tur a curve and the, the car slid all the way into the ditch. She tried to drive it out, but the tires just spun. So Charlie pushed, she pressed the gas, but no luck. They were stuck. They needed help. So they got out and they walked down the, the road and about a mile they found a house, knocked on the door and the woman says, please come in, make yourselves at home, uh, get warm by the fire, uh, the phone is yours. And she brought out cookies and tea and, and said, stay as long as you need till help arrives. Just an ordinary event. Don't tell that to the woman who opened her door. She has never forgotten the moment. She's told the story a thousand times. Because it's not every day you receive uh, royalty on your porch. For the two people that came to their door were not other than Queen Elizabeth and the heir to the throne, 10-year-old Charles. When Jesus was born, something far grander happened to our world. But he too came in an unexpected and small way. When God speaks to us, it's not usually in a huge, life-changing way. He speaks to us in a still, small voice, often through little things. So if you're wondering if God speaks to you, don't overlook the small things. Three, God speaks in the midst of evil. Verse 7, when Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Wily old Herod has no interest in worshiping the Christ child. He just wants them to report back so he can go and kill the child. Now, Herod was so wicked, he killed his own wife and son because they were a threat to his throne. When the wise men came, we figure Herod was about 70 years old and deathly sick. And he was worried so much about losing his throne. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Again, God spoke to the wise men, don't go back to Herod, he's going to kill the child. So they just obeyed and went back another way. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search <clears throat> for the child to kill him. God spoke to Joseph in a dream. 
So he got up, took Mary and the baby Jesus, and fled to Egypt. He just obeyed. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and his vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Shortly after Jesus was born, howls of grief drowned out glory to God in the highest. God's Son is born in the midst of evil. You, you ask, why didn't God protect of the little, little boys in and around Bethlehem. It's the question that haunts human history. Why doesn't God intervene? Philip Yancey wrote a book last year called The Question That Never Goes Away. This is the question. Why doesn't God intervene? 30 million people were killed uh, by Joseph Stalin under the communist takeover in Russia. Why didn't God stop it? We estimate 70 million Chinese were killed by Mao Zedong under the communist regime in the takeover and the Cultural Revolution. Why didn't God step in? Last year in Paris, France, terrorists uh, killed many people. Why didn't God stop the, the terrorists? Uh, a terrorist walked into an Orlando nightclub this year and began shooting. Why didn't God do something? Thousands of Iraqis have been slaughtered or driven from their homes by ISIS. Why hasn't God intervened? 500,000 Syrians have been murdered by the Assad regime uh, in Aleppo and throughout Syria. God could put a halt to it. Why doesn't he? We cannot count on God to intervene directly in human history. David, in the most well-known psalm, uh, writes, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The words, you are with me, reveal the one thing we can count on in tumultuous times. Always, no matter what the circumstances, we can know God is with us. The Bible records accounts of God's spectacular interventions in history, though these are rare. More often, God works through changed people to change history. Uh, we plead with God to do something, but God prefers to work through us and alongside us. As proof, God showed solidarity with us by sending His Son to join our species. When Jesus came, He didn't eradicate all evil. To the contrary, Herod proceeded to slaughter all the baby boys in the vicinity. For whatever reason, God has chosen to respond to the human predicament, not by waving a magic wand and making evil and suffering disappear, but by absorbing it in person. God sent Jesus to die on a cross for all the sin and evil in the world. He took it on himself. Choosing not to overwhelm human freedom, God instead joined us in the midst of evil and became one of its victims. God does not prevent the hard things that happen in this free and dangerous world, but instead shares them with us all. To the disillusioned disciples who watched the Romans nail Jesus to the cross, God the Father must have appeared powerless and uncaring. They must have wondered, doesn't God care? Why does he allow such a thing? Looking back on that day on Calvary, a pattern emerges of God turning apparent defeat into decisive victory. He did not prevent evil. Rather, what some meant for evil, through Christ's resurrection, God redeemed for good. All of us have faced evil and suffering in our lives, in the world at some point. We all carry some hurt in our hearts. I see some of you who uh, live alone and are going to walk to your cars tonight. You're going to see families load up their SUVs and you're going to go home alone. I see you who uh, 
are headed into some challenging family dynamics tonight or tomorrow. Uh, you're going to be dealing with ex-spouses and custody issues that are complicated. I see you who are carrying illnesses in your bodies, and you're wondering if you're going to see many more Christmases. I see you who are going to have an empty chair tonight, tomorrow, because this year there was a divorce or a loved one died, and the pain is unbearable. Whatever difficulty you face, you can know this. God is with you. In the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you know that God understands the evil and suffering you face because his son was a victim of it. And then finally, when God speaks to us, just obey. When God spoke to the wise men through a star, they just obeyed and followed it. When God spoke to the wise men not to go back and report to Herod uh, because Herod was going to kill the baby, they just obeyed and took another route home. When God speaks to you, don't ignore him. Don't argue. That couldn't be God. I must just be making things up in my mind. Listen to him and just obey. You say, I don't have faith to believe in God. I don't have faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I don't have faith to commit my life to Christ. That's not true. Everyone has faith. You get an illness you don't understand. You go to a doctor you may not have met. The doctor writes out a prescription you can't read. You take it to a pharmacist you don't know. The pharmacist gives you pills you've never seen before, and you take them. Folks, that's faith. In a moment, I want to give all of you an opportunity to show your faith by committing your life to Jesus Christ. You don't have to know everything about Christ to commit your life to Him. You just need to know enough to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came into the world to die for your sins and those of everyone else. There's no question in my mind that God speaks to us. The question is, how will you respond when he does? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you do speak to us, that you are there. There is a God. And we thank you that you spoke to us through your son, Jesus, coming. He came in a way we didn't expect, a small way, came in the midst of evil, again, differently than we thought. But you do speak to us. And we want to respond to you tonight. So I want to give you an opportunity, your head bowed, to respond to God. Uh, if you have never uh, responded to His Son, Jesus Christ, and committed your life to Him, you can do that right now where you're seated. All you have to do is uh, say, you know, I, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to just uh, follow after me if you'd like. If you have committed your life to Christ and you want to repeat this prayer with me, there's no harm in that. It's good to remind yourself of, of uh, maybe commitments you've made in the past. So let's pray together. You just whisper to yourself, uh, to God with me. Dear God, I thank you for bringing me here tonight. And I do believe that there is a God. Um, I haven't always been certain, but I'm convinced uh, tonight. And... God, I admit that I have sinned against you. I've done some things uh, I'm not proud of, and I want you to forgive me. And I believe Jesus is your son, the son of God, and he died for my sins, and I want to commit my life to him. And I want to invite you into my life tonight. I don't have a, maybe a lot of faith, but with what I have, I commit myself to you tonight. Come into my life. Make me a new person. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I promise that I'll do what I can to grow in my faith and take steps forward uh, to keep this connection with you alive. In Jesus' name, amen.